Hey everyone, Chris here. So the purpose of this video is to go over, step by step, how to make the most powerful party that you can make in d and I wasn't even going to call it the 10 steps, but once I listed them out, there were 10. So happy coincidence. Obviously that means this isn't something you can do without some coordination with the other players in your group, unless you're playing in a party of one, I suppose. But even if you're the only player using this guide for steering your character building choices, this should help you build the character that best fits with the other characters at the table. Go over the 10 steps. Good chance the other players have some of them covered. So fill in gaps and your character is going to be a valuable asset. To start with, character classes and subclasses are not created equally. If you watch any videos about optimization or read anything about optimization, you probably already know that. So it might seem like the key to the most powerful party is for all the players to make characters that are the most powerful class and subclass combinations. So you have a party of six, six chronology wizards with six one level artificer dips. That should be fantastic, right? Nope. In fact, it's crappy and I'm not guessing here. So a little background in early 2020, I started running a lot of one shots. It was kind of by accident, but I had started my Patreon and I wanted rewards for different levels of support. And I decided that the highest level would have a one hour online voice chat with me. And so that's what we did in April, 2020. And we decided pretty quickly that I should just run a casual game of D&D instead. So in May, 2020, I did a one shot for my highest level patrons, but I had like 15 people. So I had to run a one shot for three different groups. So I just ran the same one shot for all three groups and we did character level five. Then the next month I decided let's make it sixth level and seventh level in June. And I started talking about doing that in videos and my patronage began to skyrocket. Now this isn't an advertisement. You're going to find if you go to my Patreon and look at the highest level, it's going to be filled up. It's always filled up. But at the time I had no limit. At one point I was running nine one shots in one month. And it was just way too much to fit in while still making videos. So I set a limit on the number of highest spots available. And now I run a pretty standard five one shots per month with four to seven players in them. And we play fifth level. Then we add an additional level each month until we get to level 20. And then we start at fifth level again. Since 2020, we've gone through that entire cycle three times, or at least we'll finish that third cycle with our 20th level one shot in April. Now, during that time, I've also played and DM'd in campaigns as well and participated in a lot of one shots as well. And that experience is also helpful. But the one shots that I run in particular have given me some insights into not character creation as much as party creation, because I am running the same one shot for five different groups with five different mixes of characters, and they don't have the same results. In some cases, the party TPKs. I'm not one of those DMs who pulls punches or fudges die rolls if the party dies. I mean, it's just a one shot. Most players are making a different character the following month anyways. And TPKs aren't commonplace in my one shots. Most months I don't have any TPKs, but they do happen from time to time. As a player, I enjoy an element of risk. So that's the way I DM. Every one shot is something the group can be successful with but if it turns into a cakewalk, then I made it too easy. In fact, it is pretty common knowledge amongst my patrons that if they sign up for the first session of the month, they're going to be a bit like guinea pigs because if something's not working the way I planned, I often do unconventional things. Maybe it's too easy or it's too hard or it's just dragging on. Then I often tweak it for session two. But sessions two through five, I generally don't adjust anything unless they're like light on players, in which case I might tone things down a bit. The reason I'm discussing this is it means you can pick a level between five and 20, any level. And I have run the same one shot five times at that level, then another one shot five times, and then another five times all at that one level. And maybe more than five if we're talking about 2021. And we're just talking about one level of play because it's the same for every other level of play except below fifth level. And so any advice I give here, whether it applies to levels one through four, probably, but take it with a grain of salt. But definitely from level five through 20, 
This all applies. And the players I play with are mostly optimizers, but not all of them, and they mix and match. So different players playing together with different characters each month. And so I'll have a one shot, say level 10, and then I have five groups that play that same one shot and I try to run it the same five times or at least four times if I need to tweak it after session one. And what I see are vastly different results based on party composition. Sometimes groups really struggle. Others have no trouble at all. And in the past three years, I've compiled a ton of what's essentially data for what works best in a party because it doesn't seem to matter which players are in the group. What matters is the party mix. That makes a massive difference regardless of the level of play. So am I saying wizards aren't the strongest class in the game? No, they are the strongest class in the game. I definitely believe that. But how does a party of wizards perform? Absolutely awful. They either get TPK'd or it's an absolute quagmire where they run out of time and they've covered like half of the adventure. And the problem isn't that wizards aren't powerful. The problem is redundancy. Redundancy in D&D parties for anything except for dealing damage is a huge reduction in potential. Like for example, Find Familiar. This is a great spell. It's probably the most powerful first level spell, period. So six Found Familiars is super great, right? No, not really. I mean, it's objectively better than one Familiar, but it's not six times better. It might not even be three times better. And sure, you can slow an enemy with a slow spell, and that is very effective. But then if you frighten them on top of that, I mean, it's better because they still get an attack with a slow spell or might get a spell off, and frighten might help in that situation, but you're getting diminishing returns for those multiple levels of crowd control. And defensively, it's crappy too. Ask the group of wizards to make charisma saves. They're screwed. They might all fail that save. So the best party really isn't a party of just here are the best classes. It's a party that covers their bases well and avoids redundancies. Those time and time again are the parties that excel. Okay, so all that out of the way, let's get into the meat of the video. Here's how you make the most powerful party in D&D at any level of play. And these aren't in no particular order. They are in order of importance from most to least. Though, they're all important. If they weren't, they wouldn't be on the list. Oh, and every single one of these can be covered through character building, but some may also be covered through magic items, and if they are, great. It doesn't matter the source, though usually, not always, but usually magic items aren't something you're going to know about beforehand. So step number one, avoid redundancy. Ironically, I'm mentioning this again, but it's the most important factor in building a powerful party. Don't worry about redundancy in dealing damage. Damage isn't redundant, quite the opposite in fact. However, damage types can absolutely be redundant, so spread those out if you can. But you really don't want a party that's all good at the same skills, ability scores, and saving throws. The first character capable of good battlefield control is invaluable but each additional character capable of good battlefield control is less valuable than the last one. And I honestly don't think you need anyone in your party that's absolutely amazing at skill roles or using tools, but checks for these things come up in the game, and you never know when you're going to need something weird like a performance check. So the more you can spread out skill proficiencies as well as the associated ability scores, the better. Ideally, you cover everything, but you don't cover anything multiple times. And that brings us to our second step towards the most powerful D&D party, scouting. Yeah, it's not even combat, but the ability to know what's ahead and how many encounters the party's likely gonna face and what the next map is gonna be, what the terrain is gonna be, how high are the ceilings, all that stuff. It's invaluable, not just tactically, but even knowing how many resources you can spend on each fight, it's huge. The best scouting is the kind that doesn't alert the enemy. This could be a rogue that sneaks ahead, a druid wild shaped into a spider, or what I consider one of the most valuable spells in D&D, Arcane Eye. You build any party you want if they do not have the ability to do scouting and effective scouting, 
I would not call that a powerful D&D party. Number three is more obvious, single target damage. Concentrated damage wins a lot of encounters. There is no condition in the game as good at defeating enemies as the dead condition. And in a lot of fights, especially the climactic ones, there is one big bad that's the most dangerous. And you don't take them down with the area of effect damage. The big bad sometimes spawns lesser creatures, does more damage, casts scary spells, or has some other spell-adjacent abilities. They're also the one taking the legendary actions, and they are the ones that have legendary resistances. And a bit of tactical advice for you, if the big bad is spawning minions, then don't worry about the minions. Take the big bad out, because you can clean up minions all day. If you don't take out the big bad, they're just going to keep spawning. But what if you need a lot of single target damage and your character doesn't do single target damage? Then enhance the ones who do. Things like Bless. This might not seem like a flashy spell. I mean, we know it's a good spell. But you throw it on some heavy hitters and that Bless might increase their damage more than any damaging spell you could cast. Pass them Bardic Inspirations. That turns misses into hits. Cast Holy Weapon on their weapon, especially if they make lots of attacks. Concentrated damage wins a lot of the toughest fights. Damage buffs are a form of single target damage for the character that doesn't do the damage on their own. But I now have a word of caution because I've seen this happen so many times. So Bless, great spell. We all know that. So if someone casts Bless, and who are the big hitters in the group to Bless? Oh, we don't have any. Well, I guess I blessed the Eldritch Blast or Warlocks. Here's the thing. Eldritch Blast doesn't do a lot of damage. It's not terrible, but it's not a lot. That's why I use it as my baseline. And add a bless, and it's still not going to be a lot. That bless is not delivering like if you put it on a real heavy hitter. A party needs a couple heavy hitters. Then everyone else can buff them when needed. Single target damage is the one thing on this list you don't need to worry about redundancies for. Two heavy hitters drop the big bad twice as fast as one. And often, when you're talking about the powerful monsters, timing is essential. The longer they have, the worse the things they can do. There's no diminishing returns whatsoever to delivering a lot of single target damage. Now, the obvious heavy hitters are your sharpshooter, gloomstalker, rangers, or your Conjure Animal Shepherd Druids, or your Great Weapon Master Polar Master Melee Builds. Rogues can also be heavy hitters, but they kind of need a boost to become one. Either they have a way to make off-turn attacks so they can sneak attack twice per round, or they get buffed by somebody else, like an Order Cleric or a Battle Master Fighter giving them reaction attacks, or a haste spell so they can make their single hasted action weapon attack, then hold their regular action for an off-turn attack right afterwards. If you double the sneak attack, then Rogue absolutely qualifies as a heavy hitter as well. And that brings us to number four, Utility. Yeah, it's number four on the list. Really high up, huh? So someone in your party should be able to ritually cast spells. The aforementioned find familiar. Detect magic. You need that. Water breathing. Mounting everyone on phantom steeds. An augury spell or divination. Or locate object or creature. All of these can be absolutely invaluable. In fact, you know what the most valuable spell for its level seems to be in my one-shots? It's not web. I mean, web is great. So is hypnotic pattern. But no, it's passwall. Yeah, passwall. So you need to combine this with scouting to get the most out of it. But here's just one example. I had a tier 3 one-shot where the party was dealing with a time loop in a wizard tower. And there were some really tough encounters. I killed some characters in some of those fights, but one group used Arcane Eye to scout out the tower, plotted a route, cast like four pass falls in a row, pretty much depleting the high level spell slots for one caster, then they shortcutted right to the final fight with everyone else at full resources and avoided all kinds of really tough challenges and completed the one shot planned for four hours in like an hour and a half. Often the stuff you can do out of combat is more important than the stuff you can do in combat. Number five, initiative. Winning initiative is a big deal. It's not obviously a big deal because you might reasonably think that everyone gets a turn every round anyways. But first of all, that's not true. Most battles end partway through a round, so some characters are going to get more turns than others. 
But even if everyone has the same number of turns, the order in which they take them is highly important. It might be as dramatic as the party wizard dropping a hypnotic pattern that takes half the enemies out of the fight. And even if the ones remaining use actions to wake the others up, that's a lot of lost turns on round one. Or it might be as simple as the rune knight becoming large, moving up to the big baddie, grappling them, and shoving them prone. Now when their turn comes up, they can't move and they're attacking with disadvantage. This is why the Watcher's Paladin subclass is considered the most powerful, and why Gift of Alacrity is a great spell, and why Alert is a good feat. Not everyone in your party needs to be great at initiative, but if someone on your side who can do something effective goes first, it can make a huge difference. I mean, going back to heavy hitters, I have run many combats where the big bad never got a turn. They got slaughtered before their turn ever came up. Number six, battlefield control. So if you want to make a hard encounter easy, throw up a wall, splitting up the enemies, and take them out into smaller groups. A web spell in that hallway. Plant growth, bones of the earth, sleet storm. A lot of these spells don't provide saving throws at all. And even the ones that do often provide some useful effect even if they make a successful save. Creature in a sleet storm that makes it saving throws isn't going to be falling prone or losing concentration on spells, but still can't see, and its movement is still slowed. Spells like sleet storm and fog cloud also prevent sight, and if you happen to be fighting a tough monster, often it can just teleport out of that wall of force. But, you know, go pull up some monster entries and flip through until you find one with a teleport. And dollars to donuts, it needs to see the destination. So if you want to block the teleports of the enemy, block their sight. That could mean just using Wall of Stone instead of Wall of Force, or it could be a combination of Wall of Force and a Fog Cloud, for example. Number seven, crowd control. Now, I am going to include spells like Fireball here because dead is a great condition to throw on a bunch of mooks, but slow is also really nice, or Hypnotic Pattern, or Fear. A cleric would turn undead, for undead anyways. Actually, a cleric's most valuable crowd control option is probably Spirit Guardians. And then there's spells like Synaptic Static. I mean, combine area of effect damage with a mass debuff. Now, just like with battlefield control, you want to avoid redundancy here. And there can also be an overlap between crowd control and battlefield control. An enemy that's been controlled so they either can't attack or have their attacks hindered is a controlled enemy, whether they're controlled through a condition or by the battlefield. And there's no reason to stack this stuff when you could be doing other more valuable things. Number eight, battlefield repositioning. When Strixhaven came out, everyone went bonkers over Silvery Barbs. And you know what? Fair enough, Silvery Barbs is an outlier case. But the little spell that could was hiding right behind. Vortex Warp. What a beautiful spell this is. And, you know, Battlemaster fighters have Bait and Switch, which is fairly limited, but it's still decent. The underappreciated Scatter spell. The Dimension Door spell allows you to bring along an ally. Thunderstep does. Spring Aladrins can face step with a passenger. If you can teleport yourself, great. But someone, anyone in your party, should be capable of moving allies where they need to be or move them out of bad situations. And I'm also going to include flight here. Sometimes the party needs to fly. Or maybe one character needs to fly. Like the party is fighting a flying enemy and the poor barbarian is swinging that halberd at nothing. They need a hand from a battlefield repositioner. Likewise, you want someone who can move the enemy where they don't want to be. Grapplers are great at this. Warlocks with Repelling Blast can do it. Swarmkeeper Rangers, Psy Warrior Fighters. And there's a lot more. Force movement is pretty common. But once again, this can create diminishing returns if you have redundancy. The enemy that was pushed off a cliff or pushed into a web spell, they're already there. Pushing them again isn't really doing anything. Number nine, I'm going to harp on this one again, saving throws. So now I have to call out the one indispensable class here. Sixth level paladin. The difference between a party with aura protection and one without it is dramatic. Now lots of optimizers, including me, would not say the paladin is the most powerful class in D&D because it's not covering as many of these other points as some other classes can. But I would say 
If you want the most powerful D&D party possible, Paladin is the only class that is literally indispensable. Wizards are not indispensable. Other classes can cover pretty much everything a wizard can cover on this list to at least some degree. But nobody covers aura protection. And I would argue that when you get to 18th level, an 18th level straight paladin, especially a watcher's paladin because of initiative, is more valuable to a party than an 18th level sourced in because of that 30 foot aura. That makes such a huge difference. But there's more to saving throws than one person play a paladin. You gotta avoid redundancy. It totally applies here. The Dungeon Dudes did a video series on making a party with all the same class. And it was such a good series that some of my patrons have been running one class challenge one shots. I mean, that forces redundancy into your party, but that's why it's an interesting challenge. You know what absolutely destroyed our all barred party? A mind flare. Everyone dumped intelligence and nobody was proficient, and we all failed our saves against the Mind Blast, and it was over. And that's something the Dungeon Dudes missed in that series. If one of us, even one of us, had played a higher intelligence bard with the resilient intelligence feat, I know, weird feat to take, but it probably would have prevented the TPK. We had total redundancy in saving throws, and it ended us. And aura protection is great, but any additional saving throw buffs are invaluable. I mean, you're not always within 10 feet of the paladin anyways. So, Flash of Genius, Arcane Deflection, the Bless Spell. No matter how powerful you think your character build is, if you fail an important saving throw, you're probably not powerful anymore. And yes, most saving throws are Wisdom, Constitution, or Dexterity, but you don't want any saving throw that nobody is good at. In fact, I'm actually playing in an all-rogue one-shot a few days from now, and my rogue has a strength of 20, and is a GIF that gets advantage on strength saving throws. Not because that's a great way to build a rogue, but because nobody else is going to make their strength saving throws. So if it does come up, at least I will. It also allowed me to cover athletics, which nobody else was going to be able to cover to the same degree. Oh, and a final point on saving throws if you are a spellcaster that is going to be concentrating on spells, then be good at concentration saving throws, or you won't be concentrating on spells very long. And finally, number 10, condition removal and healing. If you think this should be the focus for an entire character build, I will remind you that you are looking at number 10. So unless you've got 10 players, you probably want to cover some of the other nine. But when someone goes down, you want to be able to get them back up. If someone gets paralyzed, Someone needs to have lesser restoration. And short rests alone usually aren't enough to cover all the healing a party is going to need between combats. If the heavy hitters are going into combat at half hit points, well, the only thing they're going to be hitting hard is the ground. The great thing about condition removal and healing is it's a fairly minor investment. You can absolutely make a battlefield controller or a heavy hitter or a crowd controller who can pull condition removal and healing out of their back pocket when it is needed. And although you want to avoid redundancy, it's not a bad idea to have two characters that can cover this to some degree because if the one who can is the one that gets paralyzed or drops to zero hit points, not so great, right? Oh, and someone in your party needs to be able to bring a dead character back to life. Revivify is enough, but I mean, just last month, I ran a one-shot for an 18th level party and a character died and nobody had Revivify or Raise Dead or anything. I was shocked. They were 18th level. That is a huge gap for a party of that level. Now, you can call these 10 items party rolls if you like, but you'll notice there's some things I didn't mention, like armor class. A high armor class is good, and if you want a character that's valuable to your party, the higher your armor class, the better. But it's not necessarily essential, and it kind of also goes without saying. If your entire party forgot to put on armor, you're going to have a rough time. I also didn't mention tanking. Party tank can be helpful, useful, and valuable, but it's not essential. You can totally get away without a character dedicated to being the target. I mean, it's totally possible where every player character has a pretty good physical defense. If you cover all 10 of these steps thoroughly, but avoiding redundancies when you can, 
you're going to have the most powerful party possible that will have the best performance in the most wide range of possible challenges. In my all rogue one shot, it's unlikely we'll need to make strength saving throws. But if they happen, it's covered. And that's what makes a good party a great party. And like I said, I didn't just come up with these off the top of my head. I have run many, many, many games. Now it's possible that my style of DMing has made these things more valuable than they might be at other tables. That I can't speak to. But when it comes to my game, time and time and time again, the parties that cover these 10 do well. The parties that don't sometimes have problems. Oh, and I wanted to credit Caitlin Burnell 6992 who commented on one of my YouTube videos and gave me the idea for this video. My daughter's name is Caitlin, great name. Anyways, they had one follow-up question. If mixed parties perform better, does a party with a couple of gishes and a couple of full casters count? Well, you can cover pretty much all this stuff with a party of gishes and full spell casters, so pretty much, yes. Not quite, though. The one thing they can't cover is avoiding redundancy, which happens to be number one on the list. I'm not saying it's common, but what if you land in an anti-magic field? What if the enemy mooks can spam dispel magic spells? What if the enemy has immunity to lower level spells? Is a complete reliance on magic, which can be thwarted, creating a potential Achilles heel for your party? If the answer to that is yes, well, I mean, it's still probably not going to be a problem, but if the answer is no, then it's definitely not a problem. Now, in the one-shots I've ran for patrons, and there's been 47 total, in the vast majority, a complete reliance of characters on magic is not an issue. But there's been a couple where it has. These things are in the game, even if they aren't common. And if you ignore them, you're fine, as long as they don't come up. But if they do, it's going to be a problem. So hopefully that answers your question. But if there are any insights you would like to add, please let us know in the comments down below. Otherwise, until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon.